I'm Ben Simmons and welcome to my shop. I'm here today with Mel Bryan and we're going to talk about hollow forms. We're going to be working on how you use a system, a hollowing system, to get into good sized vessels, turn nice consistent walls inside and make some pleasing shapes and hopefully not uh, blow the whole thing apart with a caught edge or anything like that. So without further ado, Mel, shall we get with it? Yes, sir. What I've done today is set up a small vessel blank and we're going to be using it to demonstrate the different techniques. Uh, this is pretty small. You could hollow this without any kind of a hollowing system other than something like a Sorby hollowing tool uh, to get in and do that hollowing all by hand. But we're going to show you how to use a bigger system today so that when you're motivated to do a longer, deeper, wider, bigger vessel that you just can't quite get with this, uh, you'll have an idea of what's available and how you might go about using it. One of the things when you start doing hollow forms is uh, stretching your own abilities to use the tools, stretching the ability of the tool to get into a long extended area and when you're working with a vessel like this it can be quite a challenge to be hooked in right over here and have the whole vessel turning out here and as you start it can vibrate, it can pull loose, it can create all kinds of difficulty so what I'm going to suggest is that if you're getting any bigger than this for illustration purposes what you probably need is some sort of a steady rest. Uh, this is a steady rest from Carter and Sons. It works very well. And what we would do then, especially with a larger vessel, is bring this in. These wheels will come up and stabilize against the vessel. And it just prevents a lot of vibration and gives you a much cleaner cut inside and a safer cut. You can make these, you can buy these, uh, but if you're going to be doing larger vessels, extended vessels, one of these can be very useful in stabilizing your material. Today we're going to take that off. I don't think that we really need to use it yet because we're still in a fairly small vessel. We'll see how it goes. All right, as we go along here, what we'll do is bring in the banjo, get our tool rest up nice and close, and the neck on this potential vessel is a little bit uneven. What I'm going to do is clean it up, square it up, and get it ready to drill into the vessel for a pilot hole or a depth gauge hole uh, that will help guide and make our turning a little bit easier. Okay, what we're going to do is just very gently clean up You can hear the unevenness zipping along there. It's getting pretty close. And then we'll make just a little bit of a dimple right here in the middle that will help guide our drill bit down here. Now if you're really gung-ho, you can use one of these or a spindle gouger and just drill right on in. Uh, I don't do that, but uh, good luck to you if you want to give it a try. What we're going to be using instead is something that I think is a lot safer. Uh, it's just a drill extension, a Forstner bit, and the Morris taper into the tailstock, like so. Banjo out of the way, and we're going to bring this up and say, oh, how deep do we go? Well, how do you know? What you do is you take a little bit of tape, you measure exactly how far you want to go into the vessel, and then with that tape, you say, okay, that's where I want to go. You kind of use one eye on this so you don't get the parallax problems. And you put that tape right there on that extender so you know how deep 
you're going to be going into that vessel. Ah, good. All locked down, and we're going to turn our speed way down now. Uh, my favorite drilling speed is oh, the upper 300s to low 400s. Uh, a lot of it depends on the type of wood that you're working through. But again, we're not in a race, let's just take it slow. This is sycamore that we're working into, and this is end grain that we're plowing through right now. And so you get the really fine shavings coming off of this stuff, uh, off of this portion of that. If you force it too much, uh, you start getting either smoke from uh, the dry wood or a curl of steam coming out from the green wood. Neither one is really particularly dangerous, but uh, it's not always pleasant. And the steam really can be a problem because it begins to heat up the inside of the vessel and can cause uh, cracking and uh, some other issues that you've got. So what we do is basically just take it nice and slow. Don't hesitate to back it out, empty that cavity out. Now, do you have to use a forstner bit? No. Uh, one of my preferred bits is one of those uh, electrician install uh, long bits in about a half inch to a three quarter inch grind. Um, and those work very well also. In fact, they, uh, they will go faster than a forstner bit. The one thing I do like about the forstner bit is that it will create a flat bottom at the bottom of a uh, flat hole at the bottom of this vessel um, instead of a little cone and it helps you get better shape in the very bottom of the vessel. But other than that, uh, any kind of a drill will work and uh, it's not even absolutely necessary that you do this. But it makes hollowing, turning uh, a lot easier if you do. Okay, we're almost where we need to be going here. And I'm approaching very rapidly the tape mark that I put on my tool extender. We'll be watching closely to match that up as it gets to that edge. And there we are. We'll clean that out, send it down again, bring it out one more time. Ah, looking good. Okay, so what we've got now is our hollow form vessel. We've got a hole all the way down to the very depth that we want to stop with the hollowing system. We're going to do a few changes in equipment here. First of all, get this off. You don't want this hanging around in your tool uh, tailstock to bump your elbow against or to drag your wrist across. Uh, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> and people wonder, oh, what are you doing? Yeah. So take precautions and get this off of here right away. And then I'm going to take the tailstock off. I'm going to come in and begin assembling the system that we're going to use for the hollowing. Okay, what we'll do first is locate this anchoring bracket in the uh, rails and get it locked down nice and tight. There we go. Perfect. Second, we have kind of an articulated arm that's going to drop down onto this post, like that. It has a locking collar to set the correct height off of the rails. And then all of this arm will be able to move back and forth pretty smoothly as we do our work over here. What We're system is this, man? This system is from uh, Simon Hope, based in the United Kingdom. And last I heard, Simon Hope was not being able to ship anything to the U.S. Uh, for insurance purposes or whatever. But there are lots of good hollowing systems that are similar on the market. And I think this will give you a good idea of uh, what one can do for it. Okay, as you can uh, probably see, this is the cutting bar. 
and it has a cutter that's attached here that will swivel to different angles around the uh, base. This will be going in and we'll be carving into the vessel like so. We'll change this angle once we get it set up. This goes into the arm. I keep all of these Allen wrenches on magnets stuck to my lathe. Uh, it's amazing how convenient that is. If you're not using these little uh, uh, rare earth magnets to stick stuff around, uh, you might give it a give it a shot. Uh, little rulers, Allen wrenches, even your uh, key for your uh, your different attachments going to uh, work well for you. We'll get this locked down like so. Same Allen wrench will loosen up the cutter and we'll make it a little bit of a straight cut to start with. As you get into a vessel, if it's a deep vessel, for example, if you're doing one like this, uh, you're going to change the angle of the cutter quite a bit to be able to get into and around a deep angle. Uh, this is pretty good. It's turned to uh, oh, less than a quarter of an inch for sure, probably uh, a shade over an eighth of an inch. It's not very heavy, nice and light, and uh, walnut. Okay, let's see. We've got the tool rest set. We've got the tool that's almost going to be able to fit in that hole. We're going to trim a little bit and we'll do some work on that. And then we take the star of the show. This is a television camera. Very simple. Um, anymore, they're fairly cheap. It's on an aluminum rod, aluminum bracket. Uh, Actually, this is nothing that uh, a lot of people can't make on their own anymore. I uh, don't know that you want to make it. Uh, some systems are already set up and ready to go. And I'm going to talk to you about a television system versus a laser system in just a second. Okay, as we get this set up and as we adjust it, what we want is our cutter really at the halfway mark, right at the middle of this so that the bottom of the cutter is not dragging on the vessel and so it goes in nice and smoothly. It can be slightly above. That's it. And you notice how small this is. I don't know if you all can see this real well right now, but it's a tiny, tiny little cutter. And the, you're going to be amazed at how quickly this thing takes off material. It uh, gets inside of a vessel. It's not overly aggressive but it, uh, it does its work uh, beautifully. Now, let's show you how this system works. We've got the camera set up here, directly over the cutter. We eyeball down the length of the shaft to make sure that it's over the cutter this direction too, so theoretically we're just straight down onto the cutter with the camera. If you're using a laser system instead, it's almost exactly the same setup. What you've got is an arm up here, but instead of a television camera, you've got a little laser that's going to shine a dot down <coughs> that will tell you exactly where this cutter is. And you'll change that dot depending on how big the cutter is or where on that cutter you want to be cutting inside of the vessel. The advantage here is that we're going to come over to our screen and we can see our cutter. I'm going to take a marker. I'm going to put a dot and circle where that cutter is. I'm going to draw in the arm that's right there. And so you can see that cutter moving up to the vessel. And I'm also going to, around that cutter, put a little set of dotted lines. It will be my starting destination for thickness of the wall. And so now as we cut, as it goes into the vessel, 
what I do is I just little by little work its way in and bring that those dots that I've drawn on the line down to the wall of the vessel. We'll see how that works. Now a word of warning, the most delicate part of your vessel other than the tenon that you've got attached back over in here is this neck. It's easy to splinter, uh, get carried away. Uh, if it does, you can always modify it and make a shorter vessel, uh, cut it at an angle, do all kinds of creative things. But we'll be kind of ginger around this. Uh, you don't want to uh, catch your tool against that and twist it because it, uh, it does bad things to the vessel. Uh, as we turn, what we want to do is bring that speed up. And a good turning speed for hollowing uh, gets you to about a scary 13, 1400. Um, but again, we're using a very small cutter and we're not in a race. We're going to take our time and just work it a little bit at a time and see what happens. And it's always nice to just try it right here in the mouth of the vessel to see how we're doing. That's pretty good. And what I'm watching now is the television camera. There's my mark. see exactly how deep I'm going. Little by little. Okay, I'm going to lower this tool rest just a hair to get us into that vessel. And what I do is I start working down that drill path that I cut a little bit earlier. And what I'm doing is going in and then just pulling back down the edge of that channel that I've already drilled into there. I'm not pushing or forcing the tool into the vessel at all. Uh, that can create some real problems should you ever find a bullet or something hidden in there. You'll know it. Uh, or if you, uh, if you find a small knot or old imperfection in the wood, it, uh, it will grab it pretty quickly. But we're just going to work gently down and we're going to, as we do at most bowls, start uh, from up here, take away the material at the top and work our way down to the mass that's in the bowl down here. Sycamore is behaving itself pretty well. Uh, famous last word. And working down that drill channel. Now, every once in a while, I'm not feeling it yet, but like I said, you'd be amazed at the material that this brings out. Otherwise, the bit starts cutting sawdust and it, uh, it starts bouncing around and gets ugly. The most delicate part is getting that bit back in without catching it. So just be cautious on the re -entry. see if we can get a little better view of the bottom of this vessel where the oh there it is now we've got it okay you can see better the edge and uh, that shows up and you can see from the camera looking down that hole that I Without the 
said, well, you didn't turn very long. As you get a uh, larger cavity inside, you can turn a little bit longer before you have to empty out the chips. But as you're starting out, kind of feel the, feel the vessel, feel it's coming nicely. watching that little dot on the outside of the vessel over here with the TV system. You're watching all those little dots that I do. Around the cutter itself. They're both good. They both work. And so, no, a system like this does not do the work for you. You still have to design a vessel, you still have to use your skills to get this done. But uh, it helps, and having a tool this long that will extend out and over that is anchored is a lot more secure feeling than trying to reach deep into a vessel with a little carbide tool or something. Okay, we're at the bottom down there. There. And I'm going to change this arm around over to the other side so it's a little bit easier for me to get to that angle. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, what we're going to do is shorten this tool up a little bit so that we can get a better angle coming into that. It won't take much. There we go. And you say, wait, now your, your TV camera is off and it doesn't match up with the tool anymore. Not to worry. Loosen that up. Bring the TV camera back. Line it up with our mark. And lock it down. And now all we have is a little bit shorter arm to get into here and get a better angle of what we were doing. Okay. And you feel kind of a soft rumbling like you're on uh, a softer road surface or something. Basically that means you got a lot of sawdust inside. And like I said, it's amazing how quickly this little cutter takes, uh, takes material off.
little bit of a vibration in there that can be either from uh, accumulating sawdust or maybe from a tool angle that needs to be changed just a tiny bit. Okay, now without the lathe spinning, let's have a look at where that line is. Up here at the neck of the vessel, here are my dots. Here's the neck. We come on in. It's coming down. That's pretty close. Coming down to there. Coming on around following that edge. Again, that's pretty close. That's not bad. And then right here it begins to get a little bit thicker. You see that? How much further you've got? And then down to the bottom and you're right at the bottom of the drill mark again. So this is the area where we're going to be working. Double check all of the tools and everything now that we're getting close. There is my tool mark. That's what I thought that it had moved just a tiny bit with the vibration. where the grain is changing direction. shavings and see where we are. I think we're pretty close. See the steam? <laughs> and of course those shavings are hot too so they hold that heat in and it starts to uh, uh, change the vessel a bit if you're working very thin walls. I think we're in pretty good shape. Let's have a look at how close we are. Again, without the lathe running, we can run this right down in here. That's pretty good. Could use another little smoothing pass, but other than that, we're pretty close. Let's do one more, just real light.
What a deal. Okay. Let's blow the shavings out. And now what we have is a vessel that has an interior surface about the same thickness that we're looking at here on the rim, all the way through. But it's a little uneven. The tool marks are still in there. There's some ripples. You can feel them ah, as you get down in there. So what we're going to do is change to another tool to take care of some of that. All right, now what we've got in place is a larger scraper cutter. And this one we have to be careful because it's, uh, it goes in at a gooseneck angle. And we'll be feeding that in. And what I want to do is have it just at center point or slightly above. There we go. And we need to do the same thing over here on the screen that we did before. You say, wait a minute, you marked up your screen. What are you going to do? Well, I'm not an idiot. Um, <laughs> basically, <laughs> sorry. Uh, basically, the screen has screen protectors on it. They're plastic sheets. And so they're made to go ahead and just uh, ride on and then remove with uh, a little bit of alcohol. So what we do is a little denatured alcohol. Quick splash. Make sure it gets sealed back up. And we just wipe our screen clean. Now, we're going to bring this tool over. And we're going to double check and make sure that the camera is right over the center of it that it's right over here and that it's at the right height then we take our marker you notice the collective there, our marker okay <laughs> like so here's the arm out here and again the same little guide pattern that I had on there before like I've told you before, I'm a little bit colorblind, so I just use the black marker. Some people prefer a different color, they can see it better or what. Uh, it doesn't make any difference to me, but uh, it's easy to mark on. The screen protector is great. The system that we're using, once again, is from Simon Hope in the United Kingdom. Uh, they were great to work with. He does, uh, Simon Hope does some beautiful turnings. You might look him up uh, just for fun. But there are companies here in the U.S. that produce very similar types of uh, uh, arms or different types of systems. Some are captive bar systems like Carter and Sons makes. Uh, very effective. It has a bar on top too. So you can't go bouncing along. It holds everything nice and tight. Uh, others are simply a guide here and they leave off this arm. You handle it all by muscle power, standing back behind the lathe and guiding it in. Do some research. Uh, some are solid. Some are pretty flimsy. Some uh, have cameras. Some have lasers. If you want to piece one of these systems together, uh, little cameras anymore in electronic stores are pretty cheap. Uh, let your fingers do the walking on Amazon and you can probably come up with the parts like this in a small screen. Other people, an option, they get a big screen. Uh, I haven't found that I need a big screen. The small one seems to work okay, uh, but that's probably because I haven't gone to the big screen to check it out yet. Uh, you can spend as much as you want to spend. The cost on this system was just right at $400 complete. Cutters, camera, monitor the works. I, I thought, hey, that's a, that's a bargain. And my wife said, yes, you need that. <laughs> she said, you not only need it, you deserve it. And so I said, yes, thank you. And so this was my Christmas present, uh, and I enjoyed getting it. Not this year, a year ago. And uh, I've put it to some pretty good use, I think, and to the point that I would recommend this system or some sort of a system to be able to do this kind of thing. If you want to use the laser, it will save you maybe $50, $75. Cameras aren't expensive anymore, and monitors aren't really that expensive. So uh, check it out. Um, it's fun, and it's easy to use. Well, I say it's easy to use. Uh, it is now that I've played with it a little bit.
And once again, the difficult part is that entry into the neck of the vessel. I'm seeing some checking along here. Uh, I think part of that was there already as we started getting into this, but I want to be real careful that I don't blow it apart if I don't have to. Again, our turning speed uh, for a good turning is up around 1300, 1400, um, depending on the size of the vessel. If you're working in a very large vessel, uh, maybe something a little more slower would be good. So we're going to take this, and we're just going to work it gently. Just a carbide scraper blade. And all I'm wanting to do is take off some of my rough edges and clean up after myself. to the bottom and go back and forth across that just a bit. Now it didn't sound like we were doing a whole lot I think, but let's see uh, let's see what we got out of there. So it really did take quite a bit of stuff off. I'm going to work on the neck of this just a little bit with the scraper to smooth it out. Nobody else is ever going to notice except a turner. And dadgummit, you put something out on the table, first thing a turner does is they stick their fingers down as far as they can to see how, how you really did. So we'll try to smooth this out just a little bit more. Well, it's a lot smoother than it was. Now it looks on here from the monitor that I've got just a little bit of thickness right down in here. Um, that's okay because it gives a little bit of ballast to the vessel and it's not going to hurt anything. But if I wanted to worry on that for the next half hour or so, I might change back to the other cutter and go in there and clean up or whatever. Let's see how much stuff we've got. So even that white cast took the stuff off of it. Now, while this is still on the, on the mount, we can clean up, we can do a little bit of uh, gouge work around here, uh, do some final shaping. We know that the thickness is right at that. So if you need to do some final shaping up here, some final sanding, tooling, getting rid of a tool mark or two, uh, that's how much material you've got left to work with. Not a lot, but it'll do. Now, let's take this off and we'll get a picture of how the system works and see if we can think of any other questions that we could uh, answer for you. Once again, this is Simon Hope. Uh, it has an arm that mounts here. It's nice and solid. Uh, articulated here, swivel in here, and the cutting tool goes in here. This will take any bar cutting tool, 
uh, and I've got an adapter to do the smaller diameter tools also. So I could buy tools from somebody else mm. and use them on this system. Um, again, my magnets on the, uh, on the lathe I can't speak enough for. They are the handiest little gadgets in the shop. This is the cutter for the scraper. Uh, it's got a screw here. I can mount any cutter that I want. I can take the Sorby cutter if I want and put it right mm -hmm. on there and they're interchangeable. Uh, the Sorby cutter itself works very well for a vessel this size. Just showing you the difference. The Sorby manual system has a flat edge right here, and the theory is that the cutter is on line with the shaft. Therefore, when this goes in to make a cut, you don't have torque on the tool to turn it, and the flat edge helps you keep it oriented the way it should. Uh, very, very effective, and lots of times I'll use it at the very end to do a little bit of cleanup if I need to. Uh, it's a nice gooseneck and it will get easily into a vessel this size. So if you don't want to go to a system like this, you can still do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, I use them both. They're both good and uh, there's an appropriate place and a time to use them. The cutter itself is mounted on a little bit longer bar. Uh, in this particular system. Again, these bars are interchangeable. It's, it's, as long as it fits the sleeve, you're going to be fine. This one's cut on the back side for an additional cutter should you need it. Uh, some people like to put a scraper on there, some people have another little bit, whatever it is. And the cutter itself from Simon Hope was this shape uh, since they weren't importing, I, uh, I emailed Simon and said, Simon, I can't get your cutter. Who's got them? He says, Hunter. Hmm. Hunter Tools, they've got them. Those little suckers are about $15 each, but they last a long, long time. And they're like any carbide cutter. If you think it's getting dull, loosen it and turn it. But be careful, don't do it here on the lathe because it's going to drop into the chip. You're never going to find a cutter that size. Get over to the table and, uh, and do it carefully. But it's just a star, star screw that goes into there and loosens it up, turn it a little bit, tighten it down, and you're good to go some more. Uh, I like it because this arm turns back and forth. Other cutters will give you different shaped cutter blades to go on there. Nothing wrong with that. That works for me too and they all are pretty much interchangeable once you get to the bar that's going to hold it. This one is long enough to do a pretty good sized vessel, deep, uh, if you're not getting lots of vibration. And again, that's where the steady rest that we mentioned at the first of the session comes in. As you mount it out here, it cuts down some of that noise and some of that vibration as you're going along. Let's have a look at where we are on this and see what our weight factor is. That's not bad. Mel, would you like to check that out? Yes, I would. Nice and light. Very good. Now that's, that's just sycamore. Uh, I like doing sycamore. It's available around here. It's a, it's a nice wood. Uh, most of the time the grain is not, not dramatic, but it can be uh, uh, textured and stained and you can do all kinds of interesting stuff with it. Uh, at another session I want to talk to you about how to get this tannin off and how to make things start looking good. We have to uh, remount this and I'm using a product called Rubber Chucky. And if you want to check these out, Rubber Chucky uh, is kind of a unique product. They make lots of things, but they, the key to a, what they call a reverse chucky is this. It's an aluminum rod. It has some extensions on it, should you need them. It's got a cone of softer material up here. It, it's firm, but it's, it's softer. And then a 
drive piece right down here. What happens is that this fits up into here. The cone slides gently up to the neck of the vessel and then the tailstock comes up here and mounts against the vessel. The pressure then to get this turned is all here in the bottom of the vessel again. The drive is right here at the bottom of the vessel and all this is doing is supporting the neck of whatever thing that you're putting in there. It works wonderfully and on another session I think we could come back and maybe, uh, maybe show you exactly how a rubber chucky works. But if you don't have one and you want to do some of this or if you're doing some bowl turning or hollow forms, uh, this has been invaluable. It really is a good product. Let me show you. Very simply, with a rubber chucky, the problem of turning a nice bottom to a vessel goes away. But again, same thing. You reverse it on here, put the pressure point at the bottom of the vessel, and turn it away. And then that little last spigot off with the chisel and light sand. Well, thank you very much. Just to uh, say again, this is a television system. Uh, if you've liked it, and a lot of people say, hey, i got to have me one of those, uh, that's great. I recommend it. Uh, other people say, no, nah, laser's fine by me. Good. Or other people want to do it the hard way and get in there with the uh, long extended carbide tool and keep guessing with the little feelers, the, the depth of your cut. Uh, none of them do the work for you. You've still got to use your brain. You've still got to design vessels. You still do the shop work and all of the finishing and all of that. But this really adds a different dimension to your work. I hope you've enjoyed this session, and we can field questions as you send them in. Thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you, Ben.